Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. This is a momentous day for the state of Connecticut. We have an excellent bill crafted with collaboration and centering on equity and communities of color in our state as we produced a system of legalization that is just and equitable. There is a certain irony in the fact that the state Senate passed the final version of this bill 50 years to the day when President Nixon declared a war on drugs and really a war on people of color in our country. So this bill will address those terrible tragedies and inequities and create a national benchmark of equity in legalization going forward, crafted to repair the wounds left by the war on drugs in communities of color in Connecticut. Other states legalized marijuana before Connecticut, but we are leading the way in legalization with a laser focus on equity. This bill in this session is testament to Governor Lamont's leadership. Together we have taken on some very big challenges and done big things in our land of steady habits. Whether it's sports betting, paid family leave, $15 an hour minimum wage, and now equity grounded legalization of recreational cannabis. Our administration has tackled some generational challenges in our state. So I want to thank the governor for his leadership, and we're going to hear from him in a minute. But we couldn't have done this work without the leadership and without collaboration uh, with our incredible legislative partners. And it's my honor to first introduce the President of the State Senate, Marty Looney. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Lieutenant Governor. This was indeed a session of, of great achievement, not only the cannabis bill, which had been uh, pending for, for years and which we in the Senate uh, felt like it was uh, Groundhog Day doing the bill over and over and, uh, and over. But uh, in addition to that, the, uh, uh, the gaming bill had also been pending for a long time. Re reform and change to the bottle bill had also been pending and discussed for a long time. Uh, we created a, a new, more equitable system for the payment in lieu of taxes system uh, by having a three-tiered system, taking need into account, uh, did away with the uh, uh, welfare liens that would uh, uh, reach back and, uh, and injure people in trying to uh, uh, sell their property later in life. There were a number of uh, significant initiatives that will make life better for the people of the state of Connecticut. And certainly the cannabis bill, I think it was important that we had the benefit of having looked at the experience in other states. And our focus was not just on creating a revenue stream, but on addressing equity issues, on looking at the communities who had been most harmed uh, by the uh, aggressive enforcement of the marijuana laws over the last uh, 50 years or more, and the injustices that had occurred, and the number of people who had their lives permanently blighted uh, by minor uh, marijuana charges and convictions. So uh, our bill was more complex, more nuanced, and I think it will be a model uh, for other states that will look to uh, adopt it going forward. So it's great to be here with the governor today who provided steadfast leadership on that and with the lieutenant governor and uh, my colleagues in the General Assembly. Uh, it's a proud moment for all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Looney, and I'm going to invite up Speaker Ritter and Majority Leader Rojas, who are going to come up together. Yes, we are. Come on, Jay. Thank you, Governor. I appreciate that. And uh, I'll turn it over to uh, the Majority Leader in a second. I want to thank uh, everybody who's with me, the Senate President. Sorry you had to vote three times, but you certainly knew the bill, you knew the bill well by that point. No one can deny that. Chairman D'Agostino, who you'll hear from, the co-chair of the, co -chairs of the Judiciary Committee, Representative Stash from Senator Winfield, and obviously the Governor and Lieutenant Governor, and all the staff that was involved in the negotiation of this bill. You know, as Marty alluded to, in many ways, this will go down, in my opinion, as an historic session. Uh, Marty mentioned some of the things that happened. I look at the Judiciary Committee behind us. How many bills have we talked about for three or four years that came to fruition? I could talk about Clean Slate, prison gerrymandering, and the criminal justice reforms that were done. Uh, Marty mentioned the aid to municipalities for the first time in rethinking pilot. Um, this is 
none of those bills in isolation makes it a historic session, but all those things coupled together, I really think people will look back and say a lot happened. But it's a good reminder to everybody in this building that timing matters too. Every time I meet a young person who's 21 years old who thinks they're going to be President of the United States, I remind them that politics is often a little bit of luck and timing. And the combination of those two things and hard work can lead to good results. Well, elections have consequences, and elections lead to results, but it takes the right combination of factors. A governor who is supportive, a Senate that can work with the House, co-chairs that work well together. You couple that with the laser-like focus that a handful of legislators put with staff on this bill, and you get a really good combination. So from the House, I thank the chairs who worked on it earlier, but I really want to give a special thanks to our majority leader, who spends an inordinate amount of time putting this bill together uh, weeks and weeks, and it's that combination of factors that makes great legislation happen. Anybody in this building can propose a bill. It's easy. You get a piece of paper and you say, this is the bill I want. The true talented legislators are the ones who pass bills, and that's why I'm proud to work with Jason Rojas on this. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you. No. I certainly appreciate the kind words of the speaker, but you know, a bill of this magnitude, a bill of uh, this complexity, um, it's bigger than any one legislator, it's bigger than any one caucus or any one branch of government, and we would not have gotten there without the work of both Senate and House leaders, uh, without the governor's office, um, without the incredible staff, and they're standing over here to my left who deserve an enormous amount of credit um, for making us look good um, as elected officials. Um, you know, the level of expertise that was needed to get this bill to where it is right now um, was really critically necessary. Not only the staff who work for both the legislative branch and the and executive branch, but certainly a lot of the advocates out there um, who were busy informing us about the process, who understood what happened in other states perhaps better than any of us could have as elected officials. Um, so this is just a really great effort. And, and now we turn to implementation, but we also turn to communicating to the public about what's in this bill. And I think uh, the other partners in this are all the people who are sitting in front of me here, uh, members of the media who are out there already explaining what the bill is, what it does, what it doesn't do. Um, so there's a lot more work for us to be done. We're going to be working on it for years, but at least in the short term, um, let's work together to inform the public about what this bill is, what the, the goals of it were, um, and what the really good product that came out of uh, this legislative session in getting this bill passed. I think it'll be the most comprehensive and best cannabis legalization bill in the country. Um, history will tell us if that's true or not, but I feel confident in saying this right now. This is the best bill in the country, and it's going to move us in the direction of ensuring that we provide a well-regulated marketplace for adult-use cannabis, for adults who want to participate in that kind of activity. So, again, I just want to thank for everybody who was involved in that, and a really proud moment for me as a legislator to work with my colleagues on getting this bill um, to the governor's desk, uh, ready for his signature. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker and Mr. Majority Leader. It's now my privilege to introduce Representative Steve Staffstrom, who is the co-chair of the uh, Judiciary Committee. Representative. Well, thank, thank you very much, and um, thank you to certainly all of my legislative colleagues and, and certainly to the governor and the lieutenant governor for their leadership on this. You know, uh, Connecticut is a state that rightly over the last decade has really prided itself on being at the forefront of criminal justice reform issues. Um, being the 19th or 20th state to legalize uh, recreational cannabis was, in my mind, a uh, blight spot on that record uh, that we have of, of taking a leading role on criminal justice reform and recognizing that this is a drug that is less addictive and less harmful to the body than several others which we regulate, including tobacco and alcohol. Recognizing the need to finally erase um, old cannabis convictions, I think, was something that was long overdue on this state. Uh, and so I'm proud as we talk, sit here and we talk about a historical session, certainly in a number of respects, and, and not the least of which was on criminal justice reform issues, that at the top of that list is finally getting legalization done uh, and finally making sure we, um, uh, we join that group of states that recognizes uh, this is a drug that can be and should be safely regulated. And I think that's what we've accomplished in this bill. Uh, and certainly I want to particularly thank um, my co-chair and, and uh, partner in uh, crime reform, uh, Senator Winfield, uh, for all of, all of, all of his uh, efforts uh, as well on this. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, uh, before I introduce uh, this next leader, 
there are two characteristics that come to mind. Uh, one is perseverance and one is tenacity, and I think I know a little bit about both of those two things, and I see both of those two things in Senator Gary Winfield. Senator. Thank, thank, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I almost didn't make it today, but then I, was, I said to myself, you know, you did that bill three times. <laughs> you should be at that uh, bill signing. It, it did get shorter every time. Uh, listen, I, I want to thank uh, the governor for making this an issue uh, of his during the session. My leadership, the leadership in the House, uh, my co-chair, uh, Representative Rojas, who uh, together we helped to kind of shepherd the legislators who were uh, working on this bill. I want to thank those legislators, uh, Senator McCrory, uh, Representative uh, Juan Candelaria and Representative Robin Porter. And at the heart of what this was for us was not just uh, we're going to legalize this uh, drug and uh, go out and make some money from it. I hear what people are saying, but that wasn't what this was about for us. This was about um, the war on drugs that the lieutenant governor talked about that started uh, many years ago. Uh, and we could talk about 50 years ago, but we can go back even further than that. Uh, and the things that have happened under the war on drugs are that we have targeted certain communities. The things that have happened under the war on drugs is that we've existed under uh, a legal scheme where we have laws that are just not just. Um, and I think what the state of Connecticut did by focusing on that, along with all of the other things that come from legalizing cannabis, uh, is to... Uh, deal with the issues of the past. The Judiciary Committee this year did have, along with the whole body, an amazing year. Now the problem I have is people are asking, what are you going to do next year? Um, but we'll come up, yeah, we will come up with something. We always do. Uh, but what makes it really amazing is not the number of bills we passed or uh, the fact that this was first or second or 19th. What makes it amazing is that incorporated into what we did was thinking about not only where we're going, but where we've been, and making sure that we deal with the things that impact communities because of where we've been. So uh, I want to thank everybody for being here today and supporting us and watching us do this bill over and over again. Um, I think it is uh, one of the most important things we did this session, but what's most important is that we uh, didn't just talk about equity, but that we built it in. Thank you. So there were two committees that really focused on this legislation. Uh, one was the Judiciary Committee, but the other was the General Law Committee. So it's my pleasure to introduce Representative Mike D'Agostino, who leads that committee. Hey, I don't have much to add uh, than what my colleagues have said. Just keep in mind two things as maybe you're right about this. Until this year, every other state that did this did it via referendum. They put it out to vote. I have no doubt if we had done that in Connecticut, if we could have done that in Connecticut, it would have passed two years ago. But we've got a legislative process here that we went through. In many respects, that was a good thing because we were able to develop this bill over years and then finalize it in the last few months. The other thing to keep in mind is we've got the benefit of a 10-year-old nation-leading medical marijuana program in Connecticut. And we've built this program on the back of that, on the back of those regulations. So we've had that experience as well. Those two things, those two pieces of this puzzle, as the majority leader said, make this the best piece of cannabis legalization legislation in the country. I want to thank our legislative leaders for the support throughout the years in passing this legislation, and thank the governor and lieutenant governor for their support as well. Thank you. So it often takes quite a while to make good things happen. Uh, the governor and I talked about this issue a lot during our campaign um, when we ran in 2018, and it's a proud moment that I get to introduce Governor Lamont to sign, to talk about this uh, important legislation, and then for us to sign it. So, Governor, it took us four years, but the more of it. Hey, first of all, let me just say, um, the last hundred times I was in this room, I would generally be sitting there by myself, Mac was over there, a couple guys from CTN, and one big camera. So uh, it's kind of nice to see you. Secondly, um, 
we have, you've been working on this for a long time. Susan and I were talking about this, and as Matt said, um, you have to work hard to get the yes. There's a hundred different roads that make it easy to vote no, and there's one road that gets the yes. And uh, Matt and Marty, you got us the yes, and it makes a big difference. I'd like to, everybody's thanking people. Um, I can tell you that Mohit and Patrick and Jonathan put in many, many hours to get this done. <laughs> And Gary, three times the charm, man. Three times the charm. <laughs> it was a really important thing to do. Uh, it's an important thing to do um, on a number of fronts. Uh, number one, in terms of equity and social justice, um, I, I love the fact that our um, this is an equity fund. It's going to give folks who otherwise sometimes don't have access to capital, the capital they need to start up their own business, focused on the most distressed communities, those communities who are hardest hit by the war on drugs. Uh, making up for some lost time there. Uh, all of us here in public office place a premium upon public health, more so than ever after this last year, and public safety. I think this is a bill that prioritizes that, make sure that we can do this in a safely regulated way. I think it is a model for the rest of the nation. Um, we've had a chance to learn from others, and I think we've got it right here in the state of Connecticut. Maybe we weren't the first, but we're the first, I think, to show that we can get it right and what that means for people going forward. So it's been a long time coming. As you heard, um, a lot of bills have been pending around here for some time. We got a lot of them passed this year. I thank each and every one of you. We all had to make some compromises along the way, but that's what good government's all about. I think the state is better off for the work you guys did over the last, uh, this legislative session. Let's sign the bill. Yeah, let's So we're going to invite all of our leaders uh, back up, and uh, we want to thank all of our media partners for coming today, and um, the governor and all of our great leaders uh, will take questions once they finish getting their photos taken. All right. All right, any questions from the media? Has. There's a, a tight time frame in here to get things up and running. Um, people in this room, if you want to leave it, uh, have certain uh, appointments to make. So can you give us an update of, of what are your goals for when to have a social equity council up and running as well as having DCP spell out the structure for how to uh, run this new business? Well, we have all of the legislative leaders in the room, ex with the exception of Mr. Speaker, but I'm sure they're going to make the appointments quite quickly, right? And if there's anyone who would like to speak to that? Sure, just uh, briefly, yes, we're looking at the, at the, uh, the legislation and we're already starting to, to look at options in terms of appointments, so I think that's, uh, that's a high priority for us. In 45 days, I think, is a timetable to have that. Is that realistic? 
It is if you start working right now. Right. Yeah, I've already begun the conversation in my office about how we're going to identify the most qualified people to serve on the Equity Council. Um, so once we get that going, you know, we're certainly, I know I'm focused on it. I'm sure everybody who has appointments is focused on ensuring that we get that Equity Council appointed. Did you guys kind of make similar processes for how you're going to sort of pick these people or are you individually going to pick sort of a, a process that you think just sort of evaluate the candidates that you feel like? Yeah, I'll let the folks speak for themselves. Jason, can I ask you a question while you're that uh, only one Republican, right, voted for this legislation. And just moments ago, the Connecticut Medical Society uh, released a statement saying that they feel that this is bad policy uh, and is dangerous. What do you say about that? Uh, listen, we appreciate their concerns. I mean, I think as lawmakers, we all recognize that there is a public health aspect to passing something like this. Um, but, you know, we, we have the days and months and years ahead to address those concerns. And I'm more than happy to work with the medical society to address whatever concerns that they have. Do you think it will be important to revisit this legislation on a regular basis to see what's working and what's not and to make sure that those who are negatively affected by it uh, get the help that they need? Yeah, it's not unlike many... Uh, pieces of legislation that we pass here. We revisit re things on a year-to-year -year basis as needed, and I'm sure something as monumental and complex as this will require us to do the same. I think it was asked how other people were about to uh, go about appointing people to the Social Equity Council. Something that's not maybe going to be a unified well, as I think we, uh, as the majority leader said, I'm sure we will both uh, have people reaching out to us, uh, seeking appointment, and, uh, and we'll also be uh, uh, soliciting people who we think might, uh, uh, might uh, contribute a great deal. So I, I'm sure there'll be uh, no shortage of interested people looking to serve. Will these requirements require any kind of uh, confirmation, or is it just you guys pick them and, and go to work? I think so. I'm not sure whether they uh, would be required to go through the executive and legislative nominations committee. I don't believe so. No. As written, the bill doesn't require uh, that they go through the uh, exact noms or any of the other processes we have. They're just appointments directly from whoever has the appointing authority. Uh, we do that oftentimes when we create boards or commissions. It's not uh, abnormal, um, and it was just the way that we chose to do it this time earlier that you know, this is not just about revenue, but it is about equity, which has been a big push for you and, and its supporters. But there's no question that this is, a, this is a lot of money to be made here. How do you keep that element, how do you keep that in check? I mean, that part, people are going to partner with minorities or people in neighborhoods and that you can't control them. Well, I think we uh, put some thought into that. That's why we have a 65 percent uh, uh, percentage that you have to be of the business. That's why uh, you can't immediately turn the business over. It's why we defined uh, the social equity applicant in a way that we did. Uh, nothing's perfect. We know that. Uh, but I think when you put some thought to what this actually is and take a look at what's happened in other places where the kinds of things that you're talking about have happened uh, and also that uh, social equity applicants have had access but not really been able to uh, participate, uh, you, you get a better system. We'll see as this happens, uh, takes place, uh, what's actually going to happen. Uh, but I think that uh, putting that thought in place before uh, we pass the bill uh, is likely to yield better results. With uh, municipalities able to have their own ordinances and banning retail pot shops, is there any sense of how many communities might be amenable to the retail cannabis industry? I don't think there's any real way. That's a question perhaps for CCM and cost uh, to answer, um, but certainly there are some communities who are going to prohibit the establishment of any kind of uh, cannabis-related industries in their communities, and that is their right, or they need to be accountable to the voters who live in their communities about whether people who live in that community would prefer to have that or not. So, And, of course, there is you know, the, the, the opportunity to, or the, the lost opportunity of some additional revenue for towns and cities as they are always seeking to diversify their revenue streams, obviously having a, an establishment will avail you of that opportunity to get that 3% of revenue. I was speaking uh, also today with some of the medic uh, medicinal dispensaries. And they have a concern that this could be putting the cart before the horse because they already are having trouble actually getting the product. They say the growers can't keep up fast enough with the demand that's out there. So what are we going to do to make sure that the growing develops before the sale happens. Yeah, I mean, I, I've spoken with a number of the current operators, and it's a mixed messaging. Some of them, 
I didn't hear that concern expressed to me when I've been meeting with those folks over the course of the session. Most of them seem to indicate that they wouldn't be concerned about being able to keep up with supply. That's a bit of an old chestnut. We, we've frankly been hearing that in the General Law Committee from dispensaries for the last few years, and we've investigated and found no truth to the assertion that there's a supply problem in the medical industry now. But mindful of that, keep in mind that the way that this law works is before any single dispensary opens to sell recreational cannabis, DCP has to go through and check the supply for medical first. And not a single sale on recreational will happen until we as a, as a legislature and the regulatory body at DCP is assured that there's enough supply for medical. Medical was first and foremost in our, in our minds, among other things, obviously, the, when we were doing this bill. Along those lines, the, the cap of 30 uh, percent THC level, some of the medicinal dispensaries said their medicinal product is between 30 and 35 percent. They think 30 percent for retail is too high. Do any of you have concerns about that THC level? Keep in mind that 30 percent is for the flower uh, only. There's a 60 percent limit for the for the um, the. Uh, the pieces, the pieces of it, the concentrate, and then there's other limits as well. When you look at the supply chain throughout the nation, actually, most products never even hit that level. So we were not concerned that that's too high. And again, there's other levels in here for the medical. So we did not have a concern about um, the levels being set uh, too high at all. It's interesting. Do you really think production is going to be a problem in this state? I mean, I would think people get into this industry and start making money, so. Yeah, my guess is that there will be. You know, I come from a town that's called the planting plant capital of Connecticut. All you need is a couple of, wire, uh, a couple of greenhouses and you can get going. Right, and I mean, I think most people's mindset right now is on the current four cultivators, but obviously the law does allow for micro cultivators as well. So we're hoping to see a cottage industry of cultivation in this with both small and large cultivators playing a role. Another question I have, I mean, when you can go up to 300% of the median income in the state, and I believe in the Bay, you guys mentioned it was 80, maybe up to about $240,000. Is, is that letting the small micro uh, business uh, entrepreneur uh, into this industry, or is that setting the bar too high? No, I mean, it's going to, you know, getting into this industry is going to require significant capital resources, and we wanted to ensure that we could actually get a marketplace stood up, and that's why we went with a kind of higher threshold for who could get into the business as an equity applicant. Um, you know, we're forgetting that half the licenses go to equity, the other half will go to the rest of the world, um, and that will open up, obviously, the marketplace to lots of individuals who have the capital to get into this line of business. Going back to municipalities, now one thing that happened in Massachusetts, uh, one issue has been that um, certain municipalities have been uh, more at times were asking for um, exorbitant um, things from, uh, has there been, you know, they found the exploitative and things like that. Yeah, that. Has any thought been given to that happening in Connecticut and you know, say or things like that? And that was largely a product because Massachusetts required can, uh, community benefit agreements and certain chief elected officials looked to use that as leverage in negotiating with uh, prospective business owners, we didn't require that in this law. We actually barred them, right? A little bit about municipalities, um, over 50,000 residents who would have to choose a public space for someone to actually smoke this. Is that accurate? Can you talk about that? Yes, there's a provision in the bill that if you're a municipality over 50,000, you have to have a dedicated public area for the consumption of cannabis regardless of whether or not you've banned retail shops, et cetera. So you have to have that if you're a municipality over 50,000. Uh, there were a number of considerations that went into that. There's a social equity component to that. Keep in mind, consumption can mean smoking or vaping. We'll see how the municipalities deal with that. But the idea is you didn't want to turn, say, the New Haven green into just a smoking free-for-all, right? So you'll have a dedicated area for public consumption. We also are concerned about with municipalities of that size. You have some larger um, housing, uh, you know, um, areas, right? And so you don't want, again, congregations outside smoking in this area or that area. You have a dedicated space in the municipality and larger municipalities only where you can consume cannabis. And again, whether that means smoking or vaping may be up to the municipality. So you have to have that if you're over 50,000. The other thing that's related to that, just keep in mind, is no municipality, even though they can ban retail sales, 
ban growing, do whatever they want in that regard, they cannot ban delivery. If there's a licensed delivery, a licensed product going to a consumer in that town, you can't ban that. How do you envision these uh, designated areas? Can you highlight? I mean, what do you think those are going to be for any municipality over 50,000? I'll leave that up to the imagination of our locally elected officials. What's the degree that they can regulate, though, the public use? Uh, Mike re referenced the New Haven Green. So can New Haven yeah. ban the a municipal? This is all in our Clean Air Act that was amended in the statute. A municipality can ban the public walking down the street, they can do anything that they want, and, and if you're under 50,000, you can ban it completely. Smoking in public, retail sales, everything. The only niche to that, like I said, is if you're over 50,000, you have to have that public consumption area, and that's it. You can ban everything else. Uh, I have a question for you regarding the Philip Morris International. Um, they have, there was a, they did a, I guess their CFO or CEO of the Chief Economic Officer, somebody uh, did an interview with Bloomberg uh, in March or April and indicated that they might be looking to get into uh, the cannabis market. Uh, do you know of any plans of, of PMI to, to do that here in Connecticut? Is that something that attracted them here? No, absolutely not. They told me they have absolutely no plans to get into the regulated marijuana market. Um, you were quite effusive in welcoming PMI to Connecticut this morning. Um, were there, was there any reluctance on your part or any misgivings about welcoming a, a company that is associated with uh, an addictive, what is still an addictive uh, product, nic nicotine, and is associated uh, with, with many, many deaths? I think uh, I was proud that um, PMI looked all over the country and all over the world and decided Connecticut is a place they wanted to make their corporate home. Particularly proud of the fact that uh, they're going to take the lead in getting people who are addicted to uh, cigarette smoking off of cigarettes. And they have an uh, alternative called Icos, which is uh, much safer and has FDA uh, authorization. I think they're heading in the right direction. We're going to be a better state, better country for their efforts. And what would you describe your role in bringing them here? You referenced this morning um, conversations that started prior to the pandemic with, uh, I guess, their previous CEO. So can you just give us a little flavor of how that went and what your role was? We found uh, we had some friends in common. And uh, that's a good way to start a relationship that's based upon trust. And uh, PMI um, came uh, quietly uh, to the state, as well as other states, uh, back before the pandemic, say uh, 18 months ago. Um, we got together informally, had a dinner at my house uh, with a number of uh, business leaders who do business in the state of Connecticut. And, uh, you know, we can all be here as advocates and say Connecticut's a good place to do business, but um, having folks who do business talking to other business people, I think, made a big difference of how the cannabis market, legal regulated cannabis market in Connecticut is going to unfold? What, what sort of profits do you expect to see from this industry? Contributions to uh, the state cost? Well, first of all, remember, it's a regulated market. Everybody's saying the THC content and what, where can I do it, where can I? The alternative is an unregulated market, a black market, an underground market where none of these things are controlled and they're much more dangerous. I, I think that is a, a driving force behind uh, what we're trying to do. How far do you expect, do you expect to see this industry take off? All I can do is look at uh, what has happened in other states. Some states have a 10-year head start on us, and I think it will be a growing industry. And um, there was questions about supply and demand, and uh, Marty winked and said maybe we're going to get back to some of our agricultural roots when it comes to um, supply. I have a question about COVID. Um, we're seeing numbers showing that young people are less likely to get vaccinated. And I'm just wondering, is that something that you should do? Well, first of all, obviously, um, ages 1 through 12 can't get vaccinated. There's nothing approved for them as yet. We just got off the phone with the COVID task force in Washington saying, what does that mean for, 
you know, summer learning camps and the such for that group that can't be vaccinated indoors, outdoors. We're thinking about that in terms of uh, the fall as well. Governors have to come up with some protocols on this pretty soon. But more importantly, for those who are eligible to get vaccinated, we've got a variety of different incentives. Look, first of all, let's face it. Connecticut, our young people, as well as our old people, are more likely to be vaccinated just about any state in the country. And that's made a big difference in terms of our infection rate, uh, which is now, um, you know, well less than 1%. And we're going to continue to do the best we can in terms of that younger population to make sure they get vaccinated. We'll be announcing some incentives um, probably in a, in a couple of days. And it involves uh, front row seats and some concerts people might like to get to. That is that 18 to 39 age group that is the toughest nut to crack, so we'll be laser focused on trying to get them to get vaccinated. On the uh, cannabis bill, there's apparently some restrictions in there on the air that smoke uh, cigarettes. Uh, I didn't really hear that debate much during the many debates. Uh, where did that idea come from? If someone could sort of articulate the thinking behind those. Well, again, as I mentioned earlier with the question, there's multiple statutes that needed to be amended for cannabis. One of those is Connecticut's Clean Air Act. And so as part of the changes to the Clean Air Act, you have to include in that cannabis. And when we were making those changes, it made sense to just update the Clean Air Act entirely. So there were additional changes that we tweaked that really hand in glove with the cannabis changes as well. We would have done these things as anyway, because frankly, our Clean Air Act is a little dated. It didn't reflect vaping, whether that's nicotine vaping products or cannabis vaping products. So that was a change that was going to happen whether or not we did cannabis. Governor, um, in your conversations with PMI, did you broach uh, whether or not they intend to offer flavors in their uh, vaping products that they're looking at? Well, A, they don't do any vaping products, well, right? They, 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 call they, it, they call it something different, but it certainly sounds like it. Heated but, tobacco, not burning yeah. tobacco. They're going to have uh, menthol and tobacco, no flavored products, period. Nothing oriented towards young people. Very strict about that. All right. And you had a... a a point of discussion about that. We did. Thank you. Speaking of young people, um, there's been a lot of concerns about this legalization sending the wrong message to young people. There are provisions in the bill that, that regulate advertising, so it's not sort of targeted. There's no Joe Camel kind of characters. Uh, uh, how do you answer critics who are concerned about the message that this sends to young people? Well, I think you answered part of it. Uh, we're very strict in terms of marketing. Um, right now, you look around the state and you see these um, Massachusetts billboards coming up like, um, you know, mushrooms in the jungle. And uh, we're going to be able to regulate that in a very strict way going forward. And I also think, um, you know, somebody grew up in the 60s and 70s, having a law that people sort of are, let's say, erratic about enforcing, unfair about enforcing. A lot of white kids, it really wasn't enforced. I think a lot of black and brown kids it was really strictly enforced. I think it created a certain disrespect for the law. I think now we have a law that people can believe in and enforce, and I think that's a good thing. Anybody else want to add to that? Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. <laughs>